To understand the behavior of cable-supported bridges, it is essential to know how the basic element, the single cable, corresponds to different loadings. In this context, it is important to realize that many engineers' intuitive understanding of structural behavior is linked to the response of beams and columns in a load-carrying system. However, in a number of aspects the cable will show a behavior that is quite different from that of beams and columns. In cable-supported structures, a single cable is used either to carry an axial load or to carry a transverse load. A typical example of a cable carrying axial load is the stay cable in a cable stayed bridge. Here, the load transfer is very similar to that found in a tension diagonal of a truss. A typical example of a cable carrying transverse load is the suspension bridge main cable. Here, the load carrying performance is similar to that of a beam. And is the topic of discussion in this video. When comparing a beam and a cable carrying transverse load, a pronounced difference applies to the supporting conditions. A horizontal beam under the vertical load will only require vertical supports at the ends, whereas the corresponding cable will have to be supported both vertically and horizontally at the ends, and, in most cases, the horizontal reactions will have to be substantially larger than the vertical reactions. For a cable carrying transverse load, the geometrical configuration is decisive due to the fact that the axial force at mid-span, which is the horizontal force, is inversely proportional to the sag. From this follows that a straight cable is unable to carry any transverse load as zero sag will imply an infinitely large cable force. The main advantage of using a cable as a load-carrying element lies in the most efficient load transfer by pure tension, where a beam would resist the lateral loads primarily by shear and bending moment. If a beam and a cable are both subject to a 27 kN per meter load on a 30 meter span, the beam would have to be 1 meter deep and weigh 8.2 tons where a cable with a 3 meter sag can be just 50 millimeters in diameter and weigh just 0.4 tons. With this result, the immediate reactions would be that cables should be preferred as structural elements in almost all cases. However, this simple comparison does not give the full picture. First of all, in real structures and especially in bridges, the cable cannot be used to directly support the deck. So, a number of supplementary elements are needed, whereas the floor in the beam bridge is directly supported by the main girders. So, in a realistic comparison, these secondary elements should of course be included and this will, especially for smaller spans, change the picture completely. Another disadvantage for the cable support is the fact that the supporting points will have to be positioned way up in the air, whereas the beam can be supported directly under the roadway. Furthermore, the large horizontal reactions required at the supporting points of the main cables will make it impossible to support them on vertical columns alone. It will be necessary to continue the main cables as backstays to anchor blocks positioned in some distance from the vertical columns under the main supporting points. So, if the load only has to be carried across a single span, then the main cable will be substantially longer than the corresponding beam. The extra length of main cable needed to reach the anchor blocks can be considerably reduced in case of a three-span structure as illustrated. Here, the cable structure corresponds to the traditional three-span suspension bridge. Another consequence of using cables is the necessity to use heavy foundations or anchor blocks required to transfer the horizontal components of the cable forces to the soil. 
One important difference between a cable and a beam is the response to a concentrated force. In the case of a cable, a sharp bend will appear under the concentrated force. But in the beam, only a continuous curvature will result when ignoring the insignificant deflections from shear in the beam. In the initial stage, the cable curve will correspond to the funicular curve of the dead load, which in general is uniform or at least quasi-uniform. Then, when the live load is added, the cable will deflect partly due to the elastic strain in the cable material and partly due to the change of geometry to achieve equilibrium. Which of these two contributions will dominate depends on the non-uniformity of the live load. To illustrate this effect, the deflection of a horizontal cable with a span of 1000 meters and a cross-sectional area of 0.56 meters square subjected to a non-uniform symmetrical live load will be shown. In the initial stage, the cable is assumed to be subjected to a uniform dead load of 220 kN per meter and to have the form of a second-order parabola with a sag of 100 meters. The live load with an intensity of 80 kN per meter is applied symmetrically in the midspan region over a length of B. For different values of the ratio B over L between the live loaded length B and the span of the cable L, the midspan deflection is plotted. In the plot, the total deflection is shown by a solid line and the deflection due to the cable displacement or change of geometry by a dotted line. The dotted line can also be interpreted as the deflection of an inextensible cable with zero strain and therefore no elongation. It appears from the plot that the maximum deflection of 3.12 meters will occur for a value of B over L equals to 0.4 corresponding to a case where the live load is acting over a length of only 400 meters or 40% of the span. For live load acting over the entire span, which means B over L is equal to 1, the mid-span deflection will be 1.65 meter, close to half of the maximum value. From the plot, it can be deduced that for B over L equal to 0.4, the displacement of the cable accounts for approximately two-thirds of the total deflection and the elongation only for one-third. For B over L equals to 1, the deflection is entirely due to the elongation of the cable. It is also interesting to note that for a live loaded length of only 10% of the span length, B over L equals to 0.1, the midspan deflection will be the same as for live load acting over the entire span. This clearly illustrates the effect of the change of geometry or cable displacement which accounts for almost the entire deflection in case of B over L equals to 0.1. For a beam, the maximum deflection will occur under maximum live load which means when the live load is applied over the entire span. And for a case with live load in only the central 40% of the span, the deflection will be reduced to approximately 70% of the maximum value. It is seen that if experiences based on the behavior of beams were transferred uncritically to the cable case, then, it would be assumed that the maximum deflection had occurred under live load acting on the entire span. And this would lead to an underestimation by a factor of close to 0.5, as the most critical non-uniform loading case will increase the mid-span deflection of the cable to almost twice the value for a uniform live load across the entire span. The importance of considering non-uniform live load will be very clear if the mid-span deflection is plotted against the sag ratio. It appears that 
if only uniform live load over the entire span was considered, as we know from a beam experience, then it would be concluded that the sag should be chosen as large as possible to give the smallest deflection. However, when considering the non-uniform case with B over L equals to 0.4, then the opposite conclusion will be reached, and it will be seen that the deflection starts to grow significantly when the sag ratio goes beyond 0.1. So, this is one of the main reasons for choosing a sag ratio between 1 over 9 and 1 over 11 for the main span cable in a suspension bridge. When the deck stiffness is really low, the deformation in the deck is highly influenced by the cable geometry change, especially by non-uniform loads such as a passing vehicle. A load case with asymmetrical live load on half of the span can be used to illustrate the stabilizing effect of dead load in cables. Doubling the dead load will reduce the maximum deflection of a cable to 55%, whereas there will be no reduction from increased dead load in the case of a beam. This is all based on the assumption that the cross sections of the load carrying elements are kept constant irrespective of the dead load intensity. The explanation of the fact that increased dead load results in a reduction of the live load deflections of a cable is that the deviation between the funicular curves for dead load alone and for dead plus live load will be smaller as the dead load increases. An important observation in the case of a three-span cable is the pronounced influence of the side span length on the deflections of the main span. To illustrate this, we take an example where the main span length remains the same but the side span is reduced in half while keeping the applied distributed loads the same. In both cases, the deflection curves are drawn for a live load of 80 kN per meter, acting in the main span only, but combined with a dead load of 220 kN per meter, acting over the entire length. It is seen that the mid-span deflection in the main span will be reduced to almost 40% if the side span length is reduced from 500 to 250 meters. So again, it is seen how the chosen geometry has a much stronger influence on the deformational characteristics of a cable than of a beam. The explanation of the pronounced influence of the side span length on the main span deflection is to be found when looking at the longitudinal displacements of the supporting points between side and main spans. It is seen that the longitudinal displacement is reduced from 1.62 meters to 0.42 meters when changing from long to short side spans. To further illustrate the deformational characteristics of the side span cable, the following shows the relationship between the relative side span length alpha and the longitudinal displacement of the upper support or the pile on top for a change of the horizontal force from 275 mega newtons to 375 mega newtons. The plot is based on a cable area that will lead to a stress of 720 megapascals in the side span cable under maximum tension. It is seen that for shorter side span lengths alpha less than 0.5, the longitudinal displacement is not too far from being proportional to the length. But, for longer side span lengths, there is a clear progression of the longitudinal displacement. This is due to the effect of sag reduction appearing when the cable tension is increased. Previously, it was described how an increased dead load would improve the deformational characteristics of the single span cable. However, in the case of a side span cable, the dead load will have the opposite effect, as illustrated for a side span cable with a span of 250 meters. 
A doubling of the dead load from 220 kN per meter to 450 kN per meter will more than double the longitudinal displacement, which again is due to the sag variations as the initial sag will be larger when the side span dead load is increased. Throughout the comparisons made between a cable and the beam, it has been assumed that the cable acts as a perfectly flexible string, which is a good approximation for the cable itself, but less evident for a suspension system where the cable interacts with the deck. However, for modern suspension bridges with slender decks, the global deflections are only to a small extent influenced by the flexural stiffness of the deck. This feature is illustrated here showing the deflections of three different systems. The cable alone, a suspension bridge with a deck composed of three simply supported spans, and a suspension bridge with a continuous deck, all having the same cable dimensions and subjected to dead and traffic loads of the same intensity. It is seen that for traffic load in the entire main span, the difference between the deflections of the three systems is insignificant as regards to the main span, whereas the uplift of the side spans is smaller for suspension bridges as the bending stiffness of the deck is more pronounced for the shorter spans. For asymmetrical traffic loads, the deflections of the three systems deviate to a larger degree but the overall shape of the deflection curves are still astonishingly alike, taking into account the pronounced differences between the structural systems. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.